I want to talk about the Miami Dolphins. Uh, I'm a big fan of Brian Flores, right? Uh, the uh, head coach for the Dolphins. And then you have Chris Greer, the general manager, right? And I believe they're doing a good job, right? They're being aggressive and they're having a win now type of attitude. And I love that. I love that because I believe in the NFL. If you are going to compete to win a Super Bowl, which is what you should be doing because that is the ultimate goal, right? To win a Super Bowl. You have to have a win now type of mentality, right? And uh, the teams that are always planning for tomorrow, it seems like tomorrow never arrives, right? I like aggressive coaches. I like aggressive GMs. I love aggressive teams because it seems like those teams are always competitive. They're always in it, right? And they win Super Bowls, right? And uh, I love what the Dolphins are doing. And I think they surprised everyone last year, right? Because I don't think they were supposed to be this good this fast. But obviously, Brian Flores is doing a good job, right? And of course, he comes from the Belichickian coaching tree or whatever. Um, but he's doing a good job. He's doing a good job, right? And, and the Dolphins defensively were good last year in some areas, right? And they had some areas they weren't that good. But, uh, you know, what made the Dolphins really good is they were huge on third down, right? I want to say they were number one, the number one defense on third down, and they were fifth in scoring. Because they did, you know, they were in the 20s in terms of pass defense. I think they were 23rd against the pass and 16th against the run. Those aren't great numbers. But the Dolphins were good at holding teams to field goals because they were the number one defense on third down, right? So they came up big in situational football. They came up big when they had to come up big. And, and, and that's why the Dolphins finished fifth in scoring defense, right? And that was one of their strengths. So now you have the Dolphins making moves, right? There's a huge trade uh, this past weekend. You know, uh, if you watch the NFL or if you're interested in the NFL, there's no way you cannot know about this trade, right? So the Dolphins had the third pick in the first round. They traded this pick with the 49ers, right? Uh, and, 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 and they swapped, right? So basically the Dolphins had the third pick. They ended up with the 12th pick and the 49ers ended up with the third pick. Then the Dolphins went to the Eagles and they traded that 12th pick with the Eagles' sixth pick. So the Dolphins moved back up to six in the first round and the Eagles are now 12. So in the end, the 49ers are three, the Dolphins are six, and the Eagles are 12. Now it's way more complicated than this, right? It's not an even trade. Um, you can kind of look at it like a three-way trade in the end. Um, so basically 49ers ended up with the third pick in the first round. They're going after a quarterback. Right. And my guess is Trey Lance, even though I keep hearing Mac Jones, I still feel it's going to be Trey Lance. But that's a whole other story. And the Dolphins ended up with a, a six pick in the first round. They ended up with a first round pick in 2023. They ended up with a third round pick in 2022 and a fifth round pick in 2021. And the Eagles ended up with a 12th pick in the first round of this year's draft, uh, a fourth rounder this year. And they ended up with a first uh, round pick in 2022. Now, obviously, the Dolphins have more picks in addition to this. That's just how it ended up after the, the if you want to call it a three-way trade, if you will, even though they were independent trades, you can look at it like a three-way trade. So I, I, like, I like this trade for both teams. I, I think it worked for San Francisco, and I also think that it worked for the Dolphins, right? Um, so here's what I love what the Dolphins did. They stuck with Tua. They stuck with Tua. And I, I, I'm big on Tua. Right. And I don't understand, especially in the media, it just seems like the entire media has turned on Tua Tagovailoa. And I remember just, you know, a, a short while ago, everyone was talking about this guy as if he was the next coming. And now everyone's bailing on him. Right. I want to remind people, especially Dolphins fans that have already bailed on Tua, because I know, you know, based on, on what I see on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, there's two camps, right? There's a camp that's like, yo, back off, be patient, give the kids some time. And there's the other camp like, eh, he's going to be a mediocre quarterback. I want to talk to, to the latter camp, okay? Remember, he's played 10 games, actually nine games, because he only played, I think, like two snaps in one game. He's played nine games in the NFL. He had no OTA, no mini camp, no preseason. Came straight from college, right, on a team that was loaded with talent. Right? He was playing for Alabama, probably the most talented team always every year in college football. Them, Clemson, Oklahoma, right? It's one of the big schools. He went from college football to the NFL in a year where he had no time to practice. 
he had no time to learn the system, right? And I think what's happening is the reason why people are putting so much pressure on Tua, because we used to be patient with quarterbacks, right? We used to be patient. If you remember Peyton Manning's rookie year, he threw 28 interceptions. Okay, Peyton Manning's rookie year, he threw 28 interceptions. Drew Brees, the first year he played 16 games, he threw 16 interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, it's not a high number, but the first year he played 16 games, he threw 13 interceptions. Remember, it's normal for a quarterback in his rookie year to have problems, right? And I think what's happening is, is especially with Dolphins fans and, 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 and you know, the so-called experts in the sports media universe, they see what Justin Herbert did, right? They see what Justin Herbert did with the, uh, uh, with the Chargers. And, you know, Justin Herbert ended up winning AP Offensive Rookie of the Year. And had Joe Burrow not been injured, right, it looked like they were like, you know, he was a little behind Justin Herbert, but he could have pulled it out. Who knows? But he got injured. But I think people are looking at, at Justin Herbert and they're looking at Joe Burrow and they're judging Tua Tagovailoa based on their performances. And I just think that's unfair. I think it's unfair. And here's why. Because football players are not binary, right? They're not ones and zeros on a computer, right? Every situation is different. Every circumstance is different, right? And, and you can't just say, well, if it works over here, it should work over here too. Everything is relative, right? Who's your coach? Who, who are you playing with? What's your situation? Does your team have a chance to make it to the playoffs or not? Like, what's your approach? Is your coach letting you throw the ball or not? For instance, when you look at Justin Herbert, right? He was playing on the San Diego Chargers and they were not in playoff contention. Okay, they weren't in playoff contention. As a matter of fact, they didn't start winning games until the end of the season. I think they won four games at the end of the season. They were losing a ton of games. One of the reasons why the head coach isn't there anymore, right? Um, so he got to throw the ball all year with no pressure. He had no pressure whatsoever. It wasn't like he had to win the game because the team was never in playoff contention, right? Justin Herbert had 595 pass attempts. You want to know how many Tua Tagovailoa had? Tua had 290 pass attempts. Justin Herbert threw the ball twice as many times as Tua did. Because like I said, Justin Herbert was in a no-pressure situation on a team that was not battling to get into the playoffs, and he literally had no pressure. And they used the season to break him in. And yeah, he did have an excellent year. I'm not disputing this whatsoever. But Tua was in a completely different situation. When Tua took over, I want to say the Dolphins were three and three, right? Something like this. And uh, Miami had a win now type of attitude, right? In other words, Miami's like, hey, we have a chance to actually get into the playoffs. So not only did Tua not have a mini camp, not only did Tua not have a preseason, not, not even did Tua didn't even get to have OTAs, right? Not only did he not have any of this, right? Now he's on a team that has a win now type of attitude in a system where he's controlled. So he's not even allowed to make mistakes. Like I showed you earlier with Peyton Manning throwing 28 interceptions, Drew Brees throwing 16 interceptions. You know, usually the rookie year for a quarterback, you know, that's the year they get to make mistakes. They get to learn. Tua was in a situation where he could not make mistakes because his team was in playoff contention. They were taking every single game serious. And he had the pressure of this. And he also had the pressure of knowing that Ryan Fitzpatrick was ready to come in if he did anything wrong. So Tua was put into a situation where he's looking over his shoulder as a rookie, wondering at any moment, am I going to get pulled, playing on a team that is trying to get into the playoffs under a coach who is controlling him, right? There's a reason why Tua had half the pass attempts that Justin Herbert did. As a matter of fact, when you average it out, if Tua had thrown the ball as many times as Justin Herbert did, Tua would have averaged 250 yards a game. But he didn't get to throw the ball as much as Tua did because, like I said, Brian Flores was controlling him, right? Miami was relying on their defense, and I don't blame them, right? Their defense was big in big moments, right? They were relying on their defense, and they were trying to win games. So it was a very controlled situation for Tua last year. He didn't get that year rookies get where it's like, just go out and throw the ball. You're going to make mistakes. No big deal. You know, this is your learning year, right? You get to learn. Tua didn't get any of that. 
not only did he not get any of that, he didn't get a OTAs, he didn't get a preseason, he didn't get a mini camp. You know what? He learned over Zoom. He got nothing. And he's a rookie on a team trying to make it to the playoffs under a coach who's calling a controlled game with, with, with the thought in mind that if I play bad, you know, I'm going to get pulled out of the game, right? That's, that's the umbrella or the pressure he was playing under. And I saw Tua in college. I know he's the real deal. I know Tua can throw the ball. I know Tua can be accurate. I know Tua can throw on the run, right? You know, his off-platform throws, they're good. They're good. He just didn't get time. And I love what Brian Flores is doing. He's ignoring the noise. He's being an intelligent coach, you know, like he has shown us and he has shown himself to be. Because right now in the media, literally everyone, that was bragging about Tua just a short time ago it, it, is, is ready to ax him out, right? They're done with him. They think he's a bust. And I don't buy this at all. I don't, matter of fact, I, I'll say this. I think Tua is going to have a better year than Sam Darnold next year. And everyone in the media, for some reason, they tolerate Sam Darnold, even though he has horrible, right? He's been playing horrible. They continue every year to tell me that Sam Darnold's going to get better. Sam Darnold's going to get better. I would argue that next year, Tua Tagovailoa is going to have a way better year than Sam Darnold. Now, if you remember, there was three games where Tua, you know, threw for a ton of yards, right? And remember, he only played nine games. <laughs> like, let's not forget, he played nine games. Three of those games, one, one was against Kansas City. He threw for 316 yards. The other one was against Buffalo, 361 yards. And the other one against Cincinnati, he threw for 296 yards. Now, in the game against Kansas City, he had 48 pass attempts. In the game against Buffalo, he had 59 pass attempts. And in the game against Cincinnati, he had 39 pass attempts. In other words, he got to throw the ball. He got to throw the ball. And if you look at all the other games, his pass attempts are way, way down. Because like I said, you know, if you watch the Dolphins games, they were tight. They were close. They were relying on their defense to win the games because they were trying to get into the playoffs. So Tua never really got his shot, but when he was given an opportunity to throw the ball, he did get his yards. He completed 64% of his passes, okay? Justin Herbert completed 66% of his passes. That's two, literally uh, uh, 2% less than Justin Herbert. Literally 2% less than Justin Herbert, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, and he averaged 6.3 yards per pass attempt, and Justin Herbert averaged 7.3 yards per pass attempt. He's right there. He just needs an opportunity. He just needs time. And, and, and the Dolphins are going to give him this, which is a good thing. And I like the way the Dolphins are approaching this. I don't think they need to worry. I don't think they need to have a backup plan, but they do, right? First of all, they signed Jacoby Brissett, right? And, and I'm not even trying to tout Jacoby Brissett, right? As, as you know, he's going to solve everything, right? He's an okay backup quarterback. He's a, I mean, he, you know, he, he's a backup plan. But what I mean by backup, backup plan, forget, forget I even brought that up. I'm just saying Jacoby Brissett's there. You need a backup quarterback. That's your backup quarterback. But what I mean by backup plan is the Dolphins also have picks over the next two years. So if it really does go bad with Tua, right, they still have capital they can deal with in, in, in 2022. And then they have picks they can, you know, they can negotiate or trade to move up if they need to in 2023. So they have, you know, they have capital to work with in 2022 if they need to trade up to, to, you know, to get a, you know, a top five pick to draft a quarterback. And then they have capital in 2023. So they do have a backup plan, but I don't think they're going to need it. I don't think they're going to need it because of where they are right now and what they can do right now. I really think if they draft well, right, because they've already, right, right, they, they added Will Fuller V. And I get it, steroids, you know, played for the Texans. And, and the other thing that's a little scary about Will Fuller V, right, is he's missed a ton of games in the last five years. I think he's missed something like 27 games out of the last five years due to injuries, right? And then he was suspended for steroids. But, but when he's healthy, he is a legit downfield threat, right? He can be a big playmaker and stretch the field. It's a good signing. Right. It's a good signing. It's not a long term solution, but it's a good signing, right? Now you have Will Fuller V. And then you have Devontae Parker, right? But more importantly, you have picks this year. And, and you already know what the Dolphins are going to do, right? So if you look at the Dolphins' needs, 
right? You can make a case they need to draft an offensive tackle, right? They, they need to beef up their offensive line. Pro Football Focus ranked their offensive line 28th, okay? There was only three teams worse than the Miami Dolphins offensive line. So I would accept that argument, right? If they went after an offensive tackle. It's not what I would do, but I would accept it. I would understand it. You could argue they need another edge rusher, right? They, they, they need a, you know, another edge rusher right there with Emmanuel Ogba, right? And, and I forget the other guy's name, Van Grinkle or whatever his name is. You know, if you, if you get another edge rusher, that would really help the Dolphins because I think they finished 10th in QB sacks, tied for 10th, right? And that would just make their defense even better. They can go after an edge rusher. And I, I would hear an argument for that, no problem. Like, I, I would accept that, right? You know, someone on the defensive line, I got no problem with that. And, or they could draft a tight end or a receiver. And this is the way I think they're going to go. Because I think, you know, with their 18th pick that they have this year in the draft also, and they have two uh, second round picks too, I think they can address their offensive line there. And then I think they signed Matt Skira, right? The, the center, and, and they're figuring things out, right? In other words, they, they, they can figure things out in the draft. The reason why I don't think they should pass on a, on a wide receiver or a tight end, by the way, is because there, 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 there are some players here in the top five, you know, uh, uh, p- potential, you know, uh, uh, players that could be picked in the top five that that could potentially be generational players, right? Generational players. Okay, so uh, you have uh, Jamar Chase out of LSU. Okay, Jamar Chase out of LSU is probably right now the darling of the wide receivers in the draft, right? And, and it's interesting because Devontae Smith is the one that won the Heisman Trophy, but everyone is high on Jamar Chase, right, uh, out of LSU. But the one I like, the one I think the Dolphins should go after if they can get him, right, and hopefully Cincinnati, right, uh, and the Falcons don't get him. Right. Hopefully they don't get them. And I think you have a good chance of them not getting them because they really need to address their offensive line. Joe Burrow was sacked like crazy. Obviously, he was injured. They need to address their offensive line. And there's a good chance they're going to draft Panay Swool, right? Or Rashawn Slater. And, and same thing with the Falcons, right? Same thing with the Falcons. But here's the cool thing, right? The Dolphins can select Kyle Pitts out of Florida. Kyle Pitts, I mean, this guy is what, 6'5, 6'6, 250 pounds. If you don't know who Kyle Pitts is, right, uh, the quarterback that was throwing him the ball was Kyle Trask out of Florida. Go watch the highlights. Go, I mean, this guy has it all. He can literally line up like a wide receiver and, and go vertical. He's got the speed. He's got the hands. He's got the ability. And, and if coached correctly, which Brian Flores can do, right, they can teach him to block. He could be just like Rob Gronkowski. If you think about it, what, what makes Rob Gronkowski so special is not only does he have hands, right? Not only is he athletic, not only can he go downfield, but he's an excellent blocker, right? He, you can put him up against the best edge rusher on the other team, and not consistently every single down, but when he's called upon, and he'll do his job. Like, he's that good of a blocker. He's also a great downfield blocker when you're running the ball, right? And when you have a tight end that can block, catch, you know, and go vertical, that'll drive a defense nuts, right? Because, you know, you don't know. Is he blocking? Is he going out for a pass? What's he doing, right? So I I like Kyle Pitts, but here's the cool thing. Let's say someone else gets him. Let's say the Falcons get him. Let's say the Bengals get him, right? That's okay. Then you can go with Jamar Chase. Either one of those players to me is a generational talent. Imagine this, okay? You have Will Fuller V, you have Devontae Parker, and you have Jamar Chase. I mean, now that's a receiving core that Tua can work with. And let's not forget, the Dolphins also have an 18th pick in the first round, right? Maybe they get Rashad Bateman at 18, right? He would be available, uh, I think, around 18th, right? Uh, The receiver out of Minnesota, right? You saw Tyler Johnson out of Minnesota this year with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He had some huge catches, right? And Rashad Bateman's a real deal. Can you imagine that? You imagine if the Dolphins, let's say they drafted Kyle Pitts at uh, uh, six, and then they picked up Rashad Bateman at 18. Kyle Pitts, Rashad Bateman, Will Fuller V, and Devontae Parker, and Mike Gusecki. Now, now judge Tua. Now, give, In other words, if you're going to judge Tua, give him a fair shot. And next year will be a fair shot. Judging him based on this last year is not good. And I love the fact that Brian Flores knows this. 
I love that he's not doing what everyone in the media is demanding, and that's to already go after another quarterback. And I guarantee you, if you give Tua Rashad Bateman, Kyle Pitts, right, and now that you guys signed Will Fuller V along with Mike Gusecki and Devontae Parker, right, and you have Malcolm Brown there too, and Miles Gaskin, right, now this offense is going to hum, right? And it really comes down to you have to address the offensive line. I get it, but like I said, you have two picks in the second round, early in the second round. I want to say 30-something and 50 or somewhere around there. You can address your offensive line there, right? Draft two offensive linemen in the second round. So the Dolphins have a ton of picks to work with, right? Uh, they have a sixth uh, pick in the first round. And they have the 18th pick in the first round. Second round, they have the 36th and 50th pick. And in the third round, they have the 81st pick, okay? Those are five picks, five draft picks that if used correctly, can, 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 can make this team very dangerous. A team that went 10 and six with a rookie quarterback who was never given his fair shot, right? You've added Will Fuller V, right? Maybe you get Jalen Waddle. Maybe you get Jamar Chase. Hopefully, I think you should draft Kyle Pitts. Either or, I'm okay with it, right? Uh, now you got Will Fuller V. You got Kyle Pitts or Jamar Chase. Maybe with 18, you get Rashad Bateman. Now we're talking. That's a Dolphins offense. I'm like, all right. All right. That's a Dolphins offense, in my opinion, that can compete with the Bills. And, 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 and the defense, right? I get it. You lost Kyle Van Noy, right? You still got Xavier Howard. You still got Byron Jones, right? You still got Emmanuel Agba, right? Like, this is a loaded Dolphins team. Use the picks correctly. Support your quarterback. Get behind your quarterback 100%. Be efficient, be concise in the draft, and you're going to have to look out for this Dolphins team. You're going to have to take this Dolphins team serious. A team that went 10 and 6 last year has a very good shot at competing with the Bills to win their division if they do things right. Hey everyone, thank you for watching SP Sports today. Please don't forget to click the subscribe button down below. This way, you are notified when we post new videos. Also, if you have a moment, leave a comment and check out our other videos.